Lecture 2. Justification from Tyndale to Cranmer to Hooker. Would you pray with me? Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to thee, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, that we may be wholly thine, utterly dedicated unto thee. And then use us, we pray thee, as thou wilt, and always to thy glory and the welfare of thy people. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We began our study of Anglicanism last week by seeking to put some kind of limits around Anglican identity. For with Anglicanism, just like any other Christian body, it needs some kind of limit, some sort of boundary markers to establish the realm of fair play. And this is necessary, I suggested, if, if Anglicanism is going to have some sort of identity that is common to all those who take upon themselves the name of Anglican and worship together according to the Anglican way in the Book of Common Prayer. Now, I think what we might find as we go on is we might discover what it is that uh, one of my friends and mentors, Bishop Alden Hathaway, says about Anglicanism. Uh, he says it's the roomiest church in Christendom. I think that's, that's right, perhaps. At least it's a, a quite roomy church. And yet, nevertheless, we still do have to have some sort of limits. So what I want you to do is just file that away. Uh, and this week, we are going to begin diving into the various issues that Anglicans have concerned themselves with from the Reformation to the present. Uh, and in particular, in this lecture, we're going to focus on a primary issue that concerned early Anglicans in the time of the Reformation. And that issue, of course, is the issue of salvation or justification. We shall do this by looking at three figures from the time of the English Reformation, William Tyndale, Thomas Cranmer, and Richard Hooker. And conveniently, or rather by design, uh, they, the, each of these three figures uh, span the, the lengthy period of the Reformation. Tyndale uh, appearing early in the English Reformation in the period that Ashley Knoll calls uh, the underground evangelical movement. We'll look at Cranmer, who presides for quite a long time over the English Reformation, uh, first under Henry VIII, where there's very modest reform, then under Edward VI, where there's dynamic and very quick-moving uh, reformation within the church. And then eventually, Cranmer, of course, lost his life as a martyr under Mary. Or I should say he gained his reward as a martyr under Mary. And then we'll look at, finally, Richard Hooker, who appears at the tail end of the English Reformation uh, in the Elizabethan period, when a, a theologian of the caliber of Hooker could more patiently and calmly assess the various issues that the Reformation had unearthed for the Church's consideration and uh, articulate with very fine distinctions a, a, a position for the Church of England. The driving soteriological insight for Tyndale, Cranmer, and Hooker, and one which, I might add, places them squarely within the stream of the Continental Reformation, was that justification is the stable basis and not the uncertain goal of the Christian life, to use Heiko Obermann's terminology. Justification is the stable basis and not the uncertain goal of the Christian life. In my estimation, many of the reformers, whether English or continental, are often guilty of caricaturing their, the positions of their Roman Catholic opponents uh, with claims that they're Pelagian or uh, caught in a works righteousness, perhaps. And yet, nevertheless, uh, in this particular territory, of where justification appears within the life of the believer at the foundation or at the, the end as the uncertain goal, they were absolutely right to draw a distinction between what they were saying and what the medieval and contemporary Catholic Church was saying. Now, for the medieval church and for contemporary Catholicism in the 16th century, 
the the Christian pilgrim was equipped with grace to live a life of good works in pursuit of, let's say, union with God and the beatific vision. And yet the 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 righteousness that merits eternal life for that believer, however much they are buoyed with grace, is always in the future, at the end of the believer's life, or at the end of a long period of uh, sanctifying grace and uh, a life of good works. And, and therefore, that righteousness that merits eternal life is always held out as the uncertain goal. Uh, in other words, the, the righteousness that merits eternal life was not so much the root of the believer's life, uh, but rather the flower of the believer's life. Um, as Augustine said a long time previous to these three reformers. Uh, when God crowns our merits, he does nothing more than crown his own gift of grace. For the reformers, however, the righteousness that merits eternal life is the basis of the Christian's life. It's not the flower, but it's the root of the Christian's life. And therefore, the Christian can live his or her life on the basis of that righteousness, righteousness, and moreover, that righteousness is not the believer's own righteousness, it's the righteousness of Christ. So, for these three reformers, good works do not flow toward justification, they flow from justification. And this was their claim, and they, they had to make this claim uh, for the very good reason that they had to face uh, Catholic objections that the Protestant doctrine of justification undermined the moral life and led to antinomianism and moral laxity. Because if God grants us the gift of righteousness and a gracious verdict apart from all works, doesn't this set, mangle the central nerve uh, of the moral life for the Christian? What they said is, is this. Justification does not undermine the Christian's moral life. It rather sets it upon a more stable basis, sets it on a firmer basis. What they articulated was something like a Christological refiguring of the moral life that sets it for the first time on a firm basis. And therefore, the reformers, uh, so the claim went, don't undermine the moral life Rather, they make it possible for the first time. Now, here's what interests me about these three figures. It's the differing ways that they relate justification and good works. Uh, and this is what I want to investigate, especially in this lecture. How they each make the claim that justification undergirds and uh, encourages a life of good works, uh, a life of sanctification, rather than undermines it. And they each have a particular way that they understand the relationship between justification and good work. So for Tyndale, the relationship between the two is paradoxical, uh, as we'll see. For Cranmer, good works are the inevitable and logical result of justification, which is received by a living faith. And for Hooker, very interestingly, and very close to Cran uh, not Cranmer, uh, very close to Calvin, I might add, uh, justification and sanctification, and therefore good works, are, so to speak, the simultaneous results of a previous and higher gift of grace, which was adoption, or incorporation into Christ, or union with Christ. Let's turn first to William Tyndale. Uh, the title of this section is Grace and Works in Paradox, for indeed Tyndale had uh, envisioned a kind of paradoxical and yet necessary relationship between the grace of justification and the life of good works. William Tyndale penned a treatise entitled The Parable of the Wicked Mammon. Uh, we know this parable as the parable of the dishonest manager. Uh, I didn't know this treatise existed until I read a book by Rowan Williams entitled Anglican Identities, and he devotes his first chapter to Tyndale's The Parable of the Wicked Mammon. 
after reading this chapter by uh, Williams, I went out and I bought the book. Uh, you can get it on Amazon in, in a, as a reprint. And I realized this, this is a magnificently brilliant work. According to Williams, the parable of the wicked mammon is perhaps the most powerful treatment of social morality to come from the Reformation era in Britain. Uh, indeed, high praise. As Williams puts it, part of its skill and interest comes from its nimble deployment of a basic paradox. We are delivered by Christ from slavery into freedom, and that freedom is experienced and expressed as indebtedness, not to God, but to each other. In other words, by justification, the Christian is given freedom from law, a freedom from the requirement of the law, and the necessity of meriting through law-keeping uh, eternal life or a gracious verdict from God. And so the Christian experiences a kind of lordly freedom. And yet the way in which that freedom is lived out and expressed is through indebtedness or paying the debt of love to one's neighbor. It's a, it's a paradox, freedom and yet service, freedom from being debtors uh, by virtue of the law uh, and the law's demand, and yet indebtedness to love one's neighbor uh, in self-sacrificial love. This treatise certainly draws heavily upon Martin Luther's The Freedom of a Christian. Uh, if you haven't read The Freedom of a Christian, I would recommend highly that you do so. Um, if not during this busy semester, then uh, just after. Uh, it's a marvelous work, but uh, here is Martin Luther's guiding insight, and this will be our way to get into Tyndale's uh, basic claims in the parable of the wicked mammon. Luther states, a Christian is a perfectly free lord of all, subject to none, a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Do you hear the paradox there? It, it works something like this. By the gift of God's grace, God gives to the believer all, every conceivable gift, uh, the gift of forgiveness, uh, the gift of adoption, uh, the gift of being an heir in Christ of eternal life, uh, the gift of Christ himself, the life of God, all of this is given to the believer in the grace of justification, making the, the believer uh, 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 possessed of a lordly freedom that lacks nothing, for the believer has been given everything. In his lordly freedom, however, the Christian finds for the first time the possibility of a truly free unconstrained in generous service of his or her neighbor. Why? Because the Christian now lacks nothing, and so now the Christian can love her neighbor uh, in an uncomplicated generosity, looking to gain nothing from the neighbor because the Christian has already received everything from God. So good works are now no, no longer burdened with having to merit anything from God through good works. Uh, instead, good works can be done sheerly out of generosity, um, out of a lordly freedom. The, good work, the believer no longer needs good works to merit anything from God. Therefore, the believer can engage in good works uh, simply because he has everything and can afford to be generous. So the Christian is perfectly free, Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. The basic paradox that is adopted by Tyndale and put to good effect in the parable of the wicked mammon. Everything for Tyndale in this treatise stems from God's indiscriminate gift of grace. The gift of grace that is not given on the basis of any merit or worth within the believer, but is given out of God's abundant generosity to the unworthy recipient. 
uh, and therefore the gift that is given before all good works that could possibly merit it. Writes Tyndale, that faith only before all works and without all merits, but Christ only justifieth and setteth us at peace with God is proved by Paul in the first chapter to the Romans. I am not ashamed, saith he, of the gospel, that is to say, of the glad tidings and promises which God hath made and sworn to us in Christ. For it, that is to say the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. For in the faith which we have in Christ and in God's promises find we mercy, life, favor, and peace. In the law we find death, damnation, and wrath, moreover the curse and vengeance of God upon us. If thou wilt therefore be at peace with God and love him, thou must return to the promises of God and to the gospel. What Tyndale is saying here is that by the gift of God, which takes no consideration of our merit, for we can by our law-keeping merit nothing from God, we have received all, life, salvation, God himself, favor, and peace. And therefore, this is a gift that is uh, indiscriminate in its generosity, which excludes good works from the office of justifying, because this gift comes prior to justification. Uh, Tyndale goes on, so likewise this is true and nothing more true that a man before all good works must first be good. And this it is impossible, or rather thus it is impossible that works by, works should be made good if uh, he were not good before ere he did good works. So we can't make ourselves good and therefore in a position to merit anything from God by our good works because this gift comes prior to good works. So again, uh, Tyndale writes, But the right faith springeth not of man's fantasy, neither is it in any man's power to attain it, but it is altogether the pure gift of God poured into us freely, without all manner of doing of us, without deserving and merits, yea, and without seeking for of us. So we have not sought it, we have not deser deserved it, we have not merited it, and yet nevertheless God gives us the grace of justification in a generous gift of indiscriminate grace. Now this is at the head of everything uh, Tyndale would, will say uh, regarding justification and the life of good works, but what happens is this indiscriminate gra grace of God sort of upsets the balance of our normal assumptions about how we ought to go about living our lives. Now, before going on and explaining that last point, I just want to note this. Uh, justification for Tyndale is not without an element of transformation, which we would assign to sanctification, the kind of internal renovation uh, that God does through sanctifying grace within our hearts. Uh, and, and for Tyndale, he, he relies especially on the notion of the power of the promise or uh, the, the word of power that effects what it signifies. So the word of justification for Tyndale is, is a kind of performative word. And so we won't find necessarily in Tyndale any kind of, rec, uh, any kind of reflection on uh, imputation as opposed to infusion, they sort of run together in Tyndale's theology. And it's, it only seems later in Protestant theology that imputation and infusion or justification and sanctification are very clearly distinguished. So this is very early within the Reformation before those kinds of distinctions. But what Tyndale relies on is uh, what contemporary philosophers call a, a performative word, a word that effects what it signifies. Uh, to give an example from uh, everyday life, or not everyday life, but at least, you know, normal life, uh, we could think of a marriage vow. Uh, when I uh, stood with my wife before the altar and we each made vows to one another, what we did through our word, of, or through our vow, through our word of promise, is that we actually created a new re reality in which we were now married. In other words, our marriage is a reality created by our word, our vows, 
uh, exchanged one with the other. You see, this is a performative word, a word that actually creates something, creates a, a, a new state of affairs. Um, or, in this one is indeed a, uh, an example from everyday life, uh, a word of affirmation. Um, what psychologists will tell us, apparently, I can't remember where I read this, but I, I took it to heart when I did read it, uh, they tell us that for every ten words that we speak to our children, nine of them ought to be words of unconditional love or affirmation. Because what happens is this. Parents, through the words that they speak to their children, actually create their children's identity. And here's what psychologists say, that if nine out of ten of uh, words spoken by parents to children are not words of affirmation, then those children will find it very hard to be well-adjusted adults later in life, uh, because they won't have the kind of identity that's uh, that's built up by the words of their parents. So parents actually create by their words the identities of their children. It's a, a, you see, a performative word. Now, if this is the case with human words, how much more with uh, God's words? And so this is what Tyndale means by the power of the promise. Uh, and here, um, you might note, he's very close to Martin Luther yet again. Uh, let me read this quotation. The promises... When they are believed, are they that justify, for they bring the spirit which looseth the heart, giveth lust to the law, and certifieth unto us the good will of God unto us word. You see, the, the promise, the word of promise, creates uh, a heart that is now free to love, creates within us uh, a desire to keep the law, and creates within us the conviction that God has given his love, and is indeed for us. The promise, the word of promise, has power. Uh, he says uh, a little bit later on, God worketh with his word and in his word. And as his word is preached, faith rooteth herself in the hearts of the elect, and his faith entereth. And the word of God is believed, the power of God looseth the heart from captivity and bondage under sin, and knitteth and coupleth him to God and to the will of God, altereth him changeth him clean, fashioneth, and forgeth him anew, giveth him power to love, and to do that which before was impossible for him either to love or do, or and turneth him unto a new nature, so that he loveth that which before he hateth, hated, and hateth that which before he loved, and is clean altered, and changed, and contrary disposed, and is knit and coupled fast to God's will, and naturally bringeth forth good works. So for Tyndale, he's, he's already uh, articulating his answer to the charge of moral laxity uh, that would supposedly uh, come as a result of his doctrine of justification by faith apart from all works. Uh, why? Because the power of the promise uh, creates a new reality within our hearts, reshapes our hearts, uh, creates new convictions, and gives us new power for Christian living. Uh, so please note that uh, justification was not an empty word for Tyndale, as it wasn't also for Luther. Um, and there's, there's very little of a distinction, if any at all, between justification and sanctification, uh, because he's relying on this notion of the performative word, the power of the promise. But he has much more to say about why it is that works necessarily follow justification. Let me read this uh, quotation that will uh, begin to make this clear within our minds why this is. Tyndall writes, For as much as faith justifieth and putteth away sin in the sight of God, bringeth life, health, and the favor of God, maketh us heirs of God, poureth the Spirit of God into our souls, and filleth us with all godly fullness in Christ, the power of the promise, it were too great a shame, rebuke, and wrong unto the faith, yea, to Christ's blood, if a man would work anything to purchase that wherewith faith hath endued him already, and God hath given him freely. How can or ought we then to work for to purchase that inheritance with all whereof we are heirs already by faith? What Tyndale says here is, it is a shame if we think we have to work to gain anything from God, uh, 
given that, God has already given everything to us freely, every gift we could possibly desire. What he'll go on to point out is that uh, this notion that, that good works are now unburdened with the necessity of justifying us, works now are free for the first time to be truly good works. Works are, for Tyndale, now bereft of the possibility of procuring for ourselves anything for ourselves from God. They can merit nothing from God because there is nothing, whether forgiveness, love, adoption, the fullness of the Spirit, that we haven't already received as the gift of God in Jesus Christ. Now here comes the paradox. The indiscriminate gift of God that has rendered works worthless from the standpoint of justification, now makes possible for the first time truly good works, works of uncomplicated generosity. Because works no longer have to gain anything because everything has been given, works can be now done and performed for the sake of our neighbor simply because we love our neighbor, not because we're trying to get anything from either our neighbor or from God. What more could we want when God has given us everything? And sound. so now we can work in absolute freedom. But because we have freedom, we can now truly serve and love our neighbor with a love that looks to receive nothing in return. For Tyndale, love begets love. God has given to us freely and without expectation of return and unmotivated by our merit, so now we can give to our neighbor in like fashion, freely, without any expectation of return, and unmotivated by merit. We are like the dishonest manager, paying our debt of love to our neighbor with the master's wealth. Don't you see how this places good works within the life of the believer on an entirely new basis. Uh, good works are now completely re are configured in a Christological vein. We are now free to love as Christ has loved out of simple generosity, not out of a mercenary desire to gain anything from God. It's the fundamental paradox of the Christian life. Works necessarily follow justification and good works can never precede justification because justification frees us up for good works the first time. So this leads to a kind of Christological shape of morality. Um, and here the, the primary passage from Scripture that's within Tyndale's mind is Philippians chapter 2, the Christ hymn. Uh, and, and see if you can't hear this in this quotation that I'm going to read. And, and do compare it to... Uh, Luther's similar statement uh, in On the Freedom of a Christian, which I have in the footnotes uh, in my notes. For look, as Christ with all his works did not deserve heaven, for that was his already, but did us service therewith, and neither looked nor sought his own profit, but our profit, and the honor of God the Father only, even so, we with all our works may not seek our own profit. Why not? Because We've already been given everything, neither in this world nor in heaven, but must and ought freely to work to honor God with all and without all manner of respect. Seek our neighbor's profit and do him service. That meaneth, Paul, Philippians 2, saying, Be minded as Christ was, which being in the shape of God, equal unto God, even very God, laid that apart, that is to say, hid it, and took on him the form and fashion of a servant. That is, as concerning himself, he had enough, that he was full and had all plenteousness of the Godhead, and in all his works sought our profit and became our servant. Just as Christ, says Tyndale, loved us from a position of absolute plenitude and fullness and wealth, being himself God, uh, and as Christ laid all of that aside and loved us, looking to gain nothing, for he could gain nothing from us, so also from we, so also we, from a position of absolute plenitude and fullness 
by the gift of the grace of justification may love our neighbor looking to gain nothing in return looking to merit nothing looking for no honor in return we can love our neighbor with an uncomplicated generosity for as a man feeleth god to himself says tyndale so is he to his neighbor I know by my own experience that all flesh is in bondage under sin and cannot but sin. Therefore, I am merciful and desire God to loose the bonds of sin even in my, even in my enemy. It's a lordly freedom that can now become a servant and love without reservation, without return, without the motivating factor of my neighbor's worthiness because that's how God has loved me in the in indiscriminate gift of his love in justification. So long as works obtain for us a blessing, you see, uh, they are mercenary and cannot be good. But now they are good as God alone is good because we've got, we've got it all, so to speak. What Tyndale goes on to articulate is a kind of social morality that flows from this and, and the indiscriminate gift of God to the unworthy without expectation of return now reconfigures Christian social existence. Uh, in two ways, we are now the debtors of all and we've got the money to pay it. And second, we now no longer make uh, distinctions of worth between human beings because um, we are all, so to speak, equal in Christ. So first, we are debtors of all. God has given us everything, even though we haven't deserved it. And, and that is an infinite debt that we couldn't possibly pay back to God. But God doesn't expect us to pay it back to him because he has everything. Uh, and so now it's as if, uh, according to Tyndale, that debt that we would normally owe to God for such a great gift uh, is repaid instead to our neighbor. We owe to our neighbor uh, a debt of love, and God has given us the wealth through justification to pay it. One Christian, says Tyndale, is a debtor to another at his need of all that he is able to do for him until his need be sufficed. Why? Every Christian man ought to have Christ always before his eyes as an example to counterfeit and follow and to do to his neighbor as Christ hath done for him. So because Christ has given us uh, an incomprehensibly great and indiscriminate gift, we can now give uh, out of our abundance uh, to our neighbor in need, uh, not paying attention to our neighbor's worth uh, or worthiness or merit but simply seeking to suffice for his need. We are debtors to all. Uh, we're debtors to all because we've been paid everything by Christ and we pay it back to our neighbor. And so think back to the parable of the wicked mammon or the parable of the dishonest manager. The dishonest manager having the master's wealth now uses the master's wealth to pay off his debt to uh, his neighbor. So must we. Second, the indiscriminate gift of God's grace now renders social distinctions of worth and value uh, among various peoples with people within society uh, utterly unuseful. Every Christian man to another is Christ himself, says Tyndale, and thy neighbor's need hath as good right in thy goods as Christ himself which is heir and Lord over all. And look, what thou owest to Christ, thou owest to thy neighbor's need. There's the idea of debtors to all again. To thy neighbor thou owest thine heart, thyself, and all thou hast and canst do. The love that springeth out of Christ excludeth no man, neither putteth difference between one and another. In Christ we are all of one degree without respect of persons. The indiscriminate gift undermines the social distinctions that would render some more fitting recipients of our love than others. Therefore, we are no respecter of persons, for those kinds of distinctions have been eradicated by the gift of God, which has not paid any attention to our merit and our worth uh, and our, uh, our deserving. So also ought we to love our neighbor. Uh, 
So here we have the fundamental paradox. Good works must follow justification. Good works do not flow toward justification, but follow from it. Uh, why? Uh, because Christ has given us all without our deserving and before all good works. Now we can love our neighbor, even though he hasn't deserved it. Before all good works, without expectation of return, we have been given a lordly freedom. And yet the way that freedom is expressed is through indebted indebtedness, not to God, but to our neighbor. And good works, for the first time, become possible.